In our honey show, Comb Alone, I said that bees were the only critters that manufacture human food. I also suggested that beekeeping was a really swell hobby. Well, I've had time to think about it, and uh, I was wrong. You know, bees don't want you to take their honey, okay? And even if you manage to do so, what are you going to do with it all? You just can't go through it that fast. I was also wrong about bees being the only critters that make food, okay? Because yeasts make food, and yeasts are critters. Well, they're, they're fungi, which means they're kind of like an insect, kind of like a plant. But they're definitely alive, and they are very adept at converting grain into beer. And they don't have stingers. Sure, homebrewing your own beer is a little bit of work. It takes some uh, unusual tools and some rather new and exotic ingredients, but it's not hard to do. In fact, it's, uh, it's not like setting up your own aquarium. It's about creating an environment where yeast can grow and eat, and raise little baby yeast, and otherwise live out their amazingly short little lifespans. Mm. Now, I know honey is indeed a golden elixir, but hey, when's the last time a pint of it made you lick your lips, huh? That is good eats. Mm, darn it! Stinking bees! Two things to keep in mind about a brew supply shop. One, it should be completely lacking in decor. Never trust a well-decorated brewer supply shop. Number two, the shop is only as good as the brain that's running it, okay? Now, if you are uncertain as to the quality of the gray matter you're gonna meet, give it a test. Hello, my good man. I am in need of brewer's yeast. Ale or lager? Meaning? Meaning, do you want it top fermenting or bottom fermenting? Ah. Excuse me just a moment. Here's the deal. There are two major branches in the beer family tree, the lagers and the ales. Now, ales, despite the fact that there's a lot of variation here, all basically have the same characteristics. They're robust and full-bodied, baby, with complex flavor, aroma, and a sassy bite, yeah! Ales are produced by top fermenting yeasts. That is, yeasts like to live on top of the fermenting beer. They also like to work with uh, warm temperatures and they work relatively quickly. Lager, on the other hand, is a whole other ballgame. Lagers are light, crisp, refreshing, and mellow. And since Germans invented the American beer industry, most American beers are actually German lagers, yeah. Lagers are produced by bottom fermenting yeast. That is, yeast that like to live and work on the bottom of the fermenting beer. They also prefer cooler temperatures and they work rather slowly. Since I don't have a refrigerator that'll hold five gallons of lagering beer, I think I'll go with the ale yeast. All right. Well, since we have quite a selection, let's go to the yeast refrigerator. Excellent. After you. I think we've got a live one here, folks. Wow, some yeast you got there. What do I need? When are you going to be brewing? I'm brewing today. Then we'll give you a liquid pitchable yeast. Pitchable, meaning? Meaning it's already in there and ready to go. Awake, alive, Awake. whole nine yards, huh? Just keep it refrigerated. When you're ready to brew, pull it out, set it on your kitchen counter. And when you're ready to pitch it, just shake it up real good, get it in suspension, and open it slowly like a carbonated soda bottle. Carbonated, of course. Uh, so what do they like to eat? Uh, any kind of grain will do, but they really like the barley. Barley. Like its cereal cousins wheat and rye, barley stores energy as starch in its kernels. Yeast can't eat this starch until it's been broken down into simple sugars through malting. To malt barley, the harvested kernels are kept warm and moist until they germinate. The germ produces enzymes which break the starches down into simple sugars. The kernels are then roasted, producing malted barley. Well, Chris, I guess you need to set me up with some barley. Well, are we going to go all grain or are we going to use some of the malt extract? What's the difference? Well, if we go all grain, then you actually have to convert the starches on your own. What's wrong with that? Well, you're looking at about a day-long project. Oh. What's the option, then? Well, if we go with the malt extract over here, the starch is already converted, so it's pretty much ready to go for you. Really? All right. I'll go with this. Well, we could do that, but... But what, Chris? But if we just use that, it's going to come out kind of bland. Oh. we got to use some of these specialty grains to give it some flavor, give it some body. Got it. Think of it this way. This is our chicken over here. Mm -hmm. This is our bam. <laughs> bam! Thanks, Chris. If you need anything, let me know. I will. I gotta hand it to him, he knows his stuff. Bam. The last thing we're gonna need, by the way, hops. Let's take a trip. 
A hop is a pine cone-like flower, which grows on a vine-like member of the cannabis family, a botanical clan well known for its, shall we say, chemical complexity. Now, each one of these little flowers contains glands, and these glands secrete a witch's brew of um, essential oils, acids, and bitter resins, which, when added to brewing beer, provide a perfect counterpoint to barley's sweet nature. They also help to preserve beer. Okay, and in the days before refrigeration, this was a pretty big innovation. I mean, imagine that you were a brewer in Dresden in, say, 1125. If you wanted your beer to have any shelf life at all, you had to make it very, very high in alcohol. Which is no problem until you consider the fact that most European cities didn't have a decent water supply. So people drank beer morning, noon, and night. The average Joe, maybe two liters a day. No wonder they called it the Dark Ages. Nobody remembered anything. Usually had hops twice during brewing, once for flavor early on, and then at the end, just for aroma. But today, I'm gonna use two different hops. I'm gonna use Cascade hops, which come from the uh, Cascade region of the United States, and also Kent Golding hops, which come from the Kent region of England. And here's your grain for you. Ah, thank you very much. Hey, what'd you do to it? I milled it for you. Milled it, why? Well, it's kind of like coffee. You have to crack it to get all the flavor out of it. Good answer. Since the stuff that comes out of my kitchen faucet tastes and smells like a public pool, I do my brewing with bottled water, okay? It's uh, always tastes the same. It's relatively cheap. It's sterile, and it's pre-measured. But I never, ever use mineral water, and I never, ever use distilled water, okay? I go with just spring water, plain old drinking water. Now I'm gonna need five gallons of water total, but I'm only gonna use four of these plus one pint. That means I'm about uh, seven pounds light. What do you know? Seven pounds. Cold will come in handy. At this point in your brewing career, your hardware needs are relatively few. Some stuff you may even have laying around the house already. In the order of use, a pot that can hold three gallons of water with room to spare, one probe thermometer, a colander that will fit inside a mesh strainer with a handle long enough to securely rest on the lid of a seven gallon fermenter. Yes, we've moved into specialty land here. Note the airtight lid with a small hole that can receive an airlock or bubbler, which allows CO2 to escape without letting germ-laden air back in. Also note the spigot. And uh, you're gonna need two of these, by the way, at least the bucket part. Next, six feet of plastic tubing that can fit onto the spigot. You're going to need a bottling tube. See this valve? Push that down into the bottle, makes filling a snap. Speaking of bottles, you can use standard beer bottles, but you'll have to cap them. And let's face it, that's not a single serving. That's a single serving. That's a 20 ouncer with a little bound up uh, stopper that you can use over and over again. They're a little more expensive, but they're very convenient. Oh, make sure you'll have enough bottles by dividing 640 ounces by the number of ounces in the bottle of your choice. If you're gonna use bottles, you're gonna have to have a bottle brush, okay? Now, all of this stuff is available in a kit, okay? If you decide to go that way, you're probably gonna get some extras. This is called a racking cane. It's used to siphon liquids to and fro. I don't use it. You'll get a capper, which is good to have around, but again, I don't use them very often. A hydrometer. This is used to measure the specific gravity of liquids. It's how you figure out how much alcohol is in your beer. It's good to know how to use this, but uh, we're not gonna use it today. Oh, you'll also need a large bucket or bus tub to sanitize things in. Speaking of sanitation, our mission here is to create an environment where our yeast can be fruitful and multiply. The problem is there are rogue microbes around everywhere that would be more than happy to muscle in on that neighborhood. You don't believe me? Go ask them. Yeah, I'd like to go live in a bucket of beer. I'm tired of this old biscuit batter. Hey, I'm tired of living up on these dreary old drapes. A beer would be a lovely change. Gerald, what do you think? Well, yes, I think a bottle of beer would just be smashing. 
<laughs> Did you say the year? I'll go back. If you allow such unsavories to colonize your beer, it could end up tasting like you filtered it through the back end of a skunk. To prevent this, we're going to mix two ounces, that's four tablespoons, of plain old unscented household bleach with five gallons of water, okay? And make sure that the bucket's clean first and make sure that all this other stuff's clean because the next step is that everything goes in the fermenter. Everything, right down in there. The bubbler, the colander, the strainer, and last but not least, the lid. Don't worry, it will bend. And don't worry about overflow. The edges need to be sanitized too. The uh, spigot will sanitize when we drain it. Oh, and don't worry about the bottles. We'll sanitize those later when we bottle. Well, let that just sit during the brewing period, which begins now. Step one. Two gallons of the bottled water go into the large pot. Then our barley, it's half a pound, goes into the water. Turn the heat to high. There. Next step, I'm gonna take the uh, probe from our probe thermometer, I'm gonna wrap it around the handle once so it doesn't hit the bottom, and into the water. Set your thermometer to go off at 150 degrees. Okay, when that happens, you want to turn the heat down and let the water temperature coast up to 155 degrees. Then use your timer, set it for half an hour. The whole thing is to have the water stay at 155 for half an hour. Why? Because we need to activate the enzymes in the barley so that they'll start to convert starch into sugar that the yeast can eat. Now this process is called mashing by brewers and the resulting liquid is called mash. Next up, we add one more gallon of the bottled water, and then the malt extract. Now this is a standard seven pound container of malt extract. Uh, since it's a syrup, you wanna heat it up before you try adding it to the pot, it makes extraction easier. I like to do this in just a pot of hot water, but I put a, a towel down in the bottom so that the plastic won't melt on the bottom of the pan. Meanwhile, go ahead and turn the heat all the way up to high. We're going to bring this to a boil. You're definitely going to do this uncovered, okay, because there is now a lot of starch in this water, kind of like pasta water, so it's going to want to foam up. In fact, uh, if I were you, I wouldn't leave the room. If it starts to foam up too much, just turn down the heat until the foam subsides and then turn the heat up again. Reduce the heat to a simmer, but always keep your eye on this pot from here on because it could foam up at any time. Speaking of time, time to add the first dose of hops, the flavoring hops. One ounce of the Cascade and three quarters ounce of the Goldings. We'll uh, hold back on the rest of the uh, Goldings and add as a aroma addition later on. Let this cook for 10 minutes. Last but not least, the final dose of Goldings, one ounce. Now this is called dry hopping and its sole purpose is to produce aroma in the finished beer. Now kill the heat, cover, and wait five minutes. Now, seven pounds of ice goes into the fermenter along with the pint bottle of water refrigerated and the final gallon of water also refrigerated. Why the ice? Well, yeast will die in hot environments, right? And uh, if we just let all this liquid cool down to room temperature naturally, it could take hours and you know who might move in. So the strategy is get everything down as quickly as possible temperature-wise so that our fungi can move right in. The way I see it, ice water mixed with vat mash should come out to about 80 degrees. Now it's time to strain or sparge our mash. So the uh, colander goes on top of the strainer securely. I like to use a colander over a strainer because the colander catches the big stuff while the strainer catches the little stuff. <clears throat> Once it is strained, this liquid is a wort, just another word for young beer. I'm going to take its temperature, 
And uh, make sure that you sanitize your thermometer before you do this. 87 degrees. I think that's safe. Time to pitch the yeast. Pitch is just a beer term for throw it in. But, uh, since the yeast is kind of settled out on the bottom of the test tube, I'm going to give it a good shake. But this is kind of like shaking up a soda, too, so always open it away from you. There. Try not to spill a drop. Simply pour it in. And then walk away. Do not touch it. Nothing goes in there. There's no stirring, no shaking. Until the brewing process is over, that area stays empty. I'm going to go ahead and grab the top to the fermenter as well as the airlock. And this is going to take a little bit of muscle work. There, secure. Now, this little bubbler is designed to let gas out but not let any in. In order to do that, it's got to have a little bit of water in it, right up to the little line on the side. There. Make sure that is secure. From here on out, make sure the handle's up. From here on out, it is up to the yeast. Stash your fermenter someplace where the temperature is on the cool side and the light is low. A closet, your basement, even a spare bathroom will do. Now in just a few hours, the airlock is going to start to gurgle and burp. It's a sure sign of fermentation inside. Now in seven days or so, the alcohol content and the acidity will rise to the point where the yeast won't be able to survive any longer. They'll die and sink to the bottom. The gurgling will slow. If on the seventh day, the gurgles are more than a minute apart, the yeasts are mostly dead and the wort is beer. There is one thing missing though, bubbles. If you want your beer to have fizz, you're gonna have to prime it with some sugar so that you get a second fermentation in the bottle. Remember, the beer in here is flat. All the gas came out right there. Of course, Table sugar is a double sugar, a disaccharide, and yeasts can't eat it. But if we boil this with a little bit of water, this bond right here will break and we'll have two monosaccharides, instant yeast chow. Big problem is, is if you get too much sugar, you'll wake up in the middle of the night, about a week after bottling, to the sounds of... No, not a drive-by shooting, exploding bottles. Too much sugar equals too much CO2 equals broken glass. So. Bring to a boil three quarters of a cup and only three quarters of a cup of sugar with a pint of water. Let it cook for five minutes and then move it directly to your second fermenting bucket. And uh, you did remember to sanitize that and uh, all these bottles and stoppers and the plastic hose and the bottling wand and sanitizing solution, right? For half an hour, right? Good. Because you know, sanitation is the first ingredient of good beer. Place the fermenter on a high surface and connect the six feet of clean, sanitized plastic tubing to the spigot. Pull the airlock out so that you don't create a vacuum. Open the spigot and let the golden goodness flow into the second bucket. Since the spigot is a couple of inches off the bottom of the fermenter, you can see that the old leftover dead yeast remain behind out of the beer, and that's good. Move the second bucket, the one containing the strain beer, up to the elevated position. Attach the plastic tubing with the bottling wand and fill the bottles. Just make sure they're sanitized and, uh, and in their boxes. That's the way I do it, at least. Open the spigot and then press the tube into the bottom of the bottle, okay, to open the valve. Now, if you fill it all the way to the top, when you pull out the wand, you should have the perfect amount of headroom or air space left in each bottle. If you get a little over the sides, don't worry about it. You can clean it up later. Later is the key word. Don't try to clean the bottles now. Snap down the lids. I like to use uh, latex gloves for this. Prevents cross-contamination, of course. And then move them back into the cool spot. Now, the bottles need to just sit. The beer has to age for about seven more days in order for the second fermentation to take place. I'll tell you the truth, though, 14 days would be better. Behold, the perfect pour. 
Usually leave just a little bit in the bottom because there's uh, generally sediment in homebrew, something you don't get in commercial beer. Now, uh, is home brewing really worth it? Is it worth the work? Is it worth the investment, albeit small investment? Is it worth the thought and is it worth the patience? Well, you know, I think I'm going to let you decide for yourself. See you next time on Good Eats.